Lynn Markham is your presenter this evening. Lynn is a land use specialist with CLU. Lynn focuses on zoning boards of adjustment and appeals, as well as land use tools and techniques to help communities. She has written several publication, publications and is co-author of the Zoning Board Handbook. Lynn is ready to begin. Thank you, Karen. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we are going to use this time to go through the basics of the role of the zoning board, whether that you're on a board of adjustment or board of appeals or otherwise involved in local government, or maybe just curious about how the process works. It all, it all fits well. Um, we will have at least 10 minutes at the end to answer some questions, um, and you can type questions in the chat box at any time, and we'll keep an eye on those. If you need clarification on something that I'm talking about at the time, if I wasn't clear, um, go ahead and toss it in the chat, and Becky will read anything that she thinks I should hear right away. Okay, so let's get started. All right, so here's our outline for tonight. Um, we'll start with an introduction to zoning, talk about the role of the zoning board, three legal standards, would you grant the variance? Um, so I'd like to launch the first poll at this point, if you'd help us out, Becky, thank you. Um, so if you can answer these questions while I go through some of the key points um, for tonight's presentation, um, I just want to hit the high topics um, up front. So go ahead and answer the poll and I'll start going through the key points. Um, the first one is that zoning board members, their role is really to act like judges. Um, they should be neutral and base their decision on the evidence and current laws. Secondly, um, variances by definition allow a property owner to do something on their land that's prohibited by the zoning ordinance. The zoning board is only allowed to grant a variance if the applicant provides evidence that they meet all the variance tests. And last, in order to create legally defensible decisions for the zoning board, um, zoning board members have to explain the reasons why each variance test is met or is not met. So that's kind of our overall. And let me pull up the poll here. Looks like most people have answered. Okay, so it looks like we have a nice mix here tonight. Um, we have quite a few Zoning Board of Adjustment or Appeals members, quite a few Zoning Staff members, as well as a number of Plan Commissioner Zoning Committee members and elected officials and a few other people. Um, it's actually really helpful to have Plan Commissioner Zoning Committee members um, so that there's good interaction between those groups in terms of each knowing what the other one um, does, what their role is. All right, so you might have to X out of the, the box with the poll results. All right. So I just wanna say that what we're doing tonight is just a brief overview of the zoning board topics. Um, for much more detail, um, you can see the zoning board handbook. The zoning board handbook is available as a PDF on our website. It's also available by hard copy. You can order it on our website as well. So you can see the chapters that we have there in the zoning board handbook. Okay, so we'll launch into zoning. Um, the purposes of zoning. Zoning is one tool, and I would argue a major tool to achieve our community goals that might be in a comprehensive plan or some other plan for our community. Um, some of those goals that we might achieve and work toward and not work against um, through zoning include protecting public health, protecting safety and welfare, um, protecting our natural resources, whether that's forests, ag land, waters, um, lakes and rivers, groundwater, drinking water, um, protecting community character and aesthetics, um, and then also protecting both public and private investment. Zoning can contribute to all of these things in our communities. 
When we look at a zoning ordinance, it can be a little overwhelming at first, um, but it always contains two parts, um, at least two parts. Um, the first is a zoning map as shown here that divides the community into different zoning districts. Uh, we'll have some residential districts, industrial districts, commercial, uh, we might have an airport. Um, and there can be mixed use districts um, where compatible uses are put together in that area, perhaps housing and certain types of businesses that are compatible. And then within each zoning district, um, there are three categories of use. There are permitted uses, conditional uses, and prohibited uses. Um, the permitted uses are allowed by right on every property within that zoning district, as long as people are meeting the standards like setbacks. Um, conditional uses um, may be allowed. That's the maybe category. Um, and prohibited uses, if a use is not listed or is listed as prohibited, then it's not allowed in that district. Um, the second part is the zoning text. Um, the zoning text will include purposes of that, um, of the entire ordinance and perhaps of specific zoning districts. It'll list the permitted, conditional, and prohibited uses in each district, and it'll have dimensional standards, lot sizes, setbacks, height limits, density. Um, it may also have a number of other pieces related to parking, signage, and so forth. And it'll have the authorities. Where in statute does it say that this can happen? Who does what related to zoning um, and procedures for enforcement? When I say dimensional standards, um, that's shown here. Um, so it has typically minimum lot sizes. It could be maximum lot sizes. Um, and then the size and location of buildings on the parcel. So here you can see the setback from the road up here, from the side yard, from the water down here. And what's left when you apply those setbacks is the buildable area of a lot. This is a very helpful thing to be able to see when you're deciding on variances, you know, what area is buildable on the lot according to the ordinance and what is not. In addition to what we just talked about, which is general zoning, there's also overlay zoning. These are special zoning districts with certain purposes. Um, they apply in addition to the base layer, the general zoning layer, um, and the most restrictive standards apply. Um, some examples of overlay zoning include shoreland and floodplain zoning, as well as wellhead protection, an area near typically a municipal well where you limit uses in order to pr protect the drinking water quality. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into the zoning board of adjustment or appeals. Um, according to Wisconsin state statutes, counties and towns without village powers have boards of adjustment. Um, cities, villages, and towns that have village powers have boards of appeal. So they're different names, but they do exactly the same thing, whether it's a board of adjustment or a board of appeal. Um, we also have some short names for those, um, the zoning board or the BOA. It's important to note that the zoning board is very different from the zoning committee. The zoning committee is usually made up of elected officials, whereas the zoning board is typically not elected officials. Okay, so there are three types of decisions that fall under zoning. We've got legislative decisions um, made by the governing body, like the county board or the common council or the village board or town board. We have, and you can see those decisions, there's a lot of discretion. Um, then we have quasi-judicial. This is where the zoning board fits in. Um, anyone who's deciding on variances, conditional uses, administrative appeals, those are quasi-judicial decisions. And for the quasi-judicial decisions, the zoning board has limited powers, um, more than administrative, but less than legislative in terms of the flexibility or discretion that they have. And what applies to zoning boards is zoning boards have to apply 
predetermined standards um, that come from state statute, and there may be additional standards in the local ordinance. Sometimes we call them standards, sometimes we call them tests, um, but you have, the zoning board has to apply those. Um, they can also add additional conditions um, and the discussion of a zoning board matter like a variance or an administrative appeal can only happen during the hearing. It's not something that zoning board members should talk to the applicant outside of the hearing or talk to the neighbors outside of the hearing. And then the third category is our administrative um, decisions and those have the least discretion. Okay, when we look at zoning roles, I just want to differentiate a little bit. It's the elected officials that adopt and amend the zoning ordinance. So they decide what the zoning ordinance says. They're elected to do that. They represent their constituents. In contrast, the zoning board members act like judges and apply the ordinance as it's written today, as well as the state laws. Um, I think it's important to let applicants that are coming in front of the zoning board know that the zoning board has limited powers. The zoning board does not have the authority to change the law. They have to follow the laws as they're written today. Um, and in terms of making legally defensible decisions, um, the zoning board is only allowed to approve variances when the applicant shows that they've met all three legal standards or legal tests. And it's possible that your ordinance has more than three, but there are three in Wisconsin law, Wisconsin state statutes that always apply. And we'll be talking about those. Okay. So um, I just wanna point out that on the resources page, we have this zoning board announcement. The purpose of this is it's something you can read at the beginning of your zoning board hearings and meetings um, to let the public, to let the people who are coming to provide evidence, to weigh in on the situation, to let them know what the zoning board is and what they can do and what they can't do and what kind of evidence they're looking for. So this is available on the resources page. You can tailor it to your community. Um, but the standards, the tests are included in it. Okay, so now just to provide a little summary, we've said the zoning board functions like a court. There's three types of laws that the zoning board members have to follow. State statutes, case law, that's the court decisions um, from the Supreme Court and the published decisions from the Court of Appeals, and then the local zoning ordinance. Um, so the zoning boards apply these to particular fact situations in order to make decisions, quasi-judicial decisions, that is like a judge. And like we mentioned, they have to apply the laws as they're written today. They can't change them to what they might like them to be. Um, so zoning board members are neutral and weigh the evidence. And if if your real goal is to change the ordinance, you can make those recommendations from the zoning board, but it is the elected officials that get to vote on changing the ordinance. So you could also run for office if that's what you want to do. Um, the zoning board decisions, like court decisions, can be appealed to higher courts. So when we say you're acting like a judge, um, it's kind of what's shown here. Um, it's the blindfold. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter who the applicant is, but simply weighing the evidence on the scales, how much evidence is there that a variance test is met or not met, um, and making the decision based on that. And here's how zoning board decisions are appealed. Um, if you make a decision as a zoning board and someone chooses to appeal your decision, first of all, it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It just means they didn't like your decision. And typically it means they're willing to hire an attorney. But they would appeal first to circuit court. And then from there, there's another level to go up to court of appeals. And then they can also appeal to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. All right, if your zoning board follows the three types of law, um, the state statutes, the case law, and your local zoning ordinance, then your decisions are typically gonna be upheld if they're taken to the courts. Um, having that solid legal record 
um, good documentation of why you reached the decision that you did. In other words, clearly stating your reasons um, that minimizes legal costs and zoning board reconsideration, which is when the courts send a decision back to you. Um, I saw there were a number of members um, from towns coming tonight. Um, so I wanted to include a little bit about how towns interact with zoning boards. Um, if you are in a town with your own zoning, then your town zoning board makes the final decision on variances. And those decisions can be appealed to circuit court. If um, you're under county zoning, um, it's really a shared county town zoning, or if it's a shoreland zoning case, um, then the town board or the town plan commission would be making a recommendation on the variance that would go to the county zoning board. They would make the final decision on the variance, and then it could be appealed to circuit court from there. Whoops. Okay, just two slides about open meetings. Um, zoning boards have to comply with open meetings law. Meetings are always open and accessible to the public, and the public is provided with advance notice. Um, you've maybe heard of closed sessions. This is where the board would go in a closed room. The public would not be able to listen to what was happening. And closed sessions can only happen for reasons listed in Wisconsin statutes. Um, related to zoning boards, really the only reason to go into closed session is if you've already made your decision on a variance or another zoning board matter, and then it's being taken to court. Then you can meet with counsel um, in order to decide how you're going to present your case. Um, making decisions on whether to grant a variance or a conditional use or an administrative appeal, those decisions, the discussion before them and the decision may not be decided in closed session. That needs to be made in open session. Okay, so um, feel free to ask any questions or comments um, using the chat box. And I am going to launch into variances. Um, so variances are probably the most common decision made by zoning boards. Some zoning boards also decide on conditional uses, um, but all zoning boards decide on variances. So variances allow a landowner to do something that the zoning ordinance prohibits. Um, variances can be used to provide relief in limited and unusual circumstances, but variances aren't meant to provide general flexibility in ordinances. They're not meant to um, give people everything they might want. Um, there's a balance between what's good for the community and what's good for a given um, landowner. Um, and it, like we talked about earlier, it's elected officials that can revise or change the zoning ordinance um, to change the level of flexibility, to change setbacks, to change the standards in the zoning ordinance. Okay, why do zoning board, why do variance decisions matter? If you think about the purposes of a zoning ordinance um, being held in a bucket, being the water in the bucket, um, so if we think about a general zoning ordinance, that would be public health, safety, and welfare. Um, when variances are granted that don't meet those legal standards, the purposes of the ordinance, the water, it leaks out and it's lost throughout the community. I'm gonna give you a few examples. Um, under general zoning, our purposes are health, safety, and welfare. If we think about roadway setbacks, the purposes for those are safety, and to accommodate future road widening and adding or replacing utilities. Um, and sometimes granting variances can reduce those purposes of health, safety, and welfare. This aerial photo is from the area I grew up in. This is Carver School Road here, and this is Highway 20, and they both have speed limits of 55 miles an hour. Um, I used to drive down Carver School Road up here to the stop sign on my way to the high school. Um, you would stop at this stop sign, 
And it was very difficult to see back this way, to see if anybody was coming because a home and garage had been built very close to that road. I suspect within the setback um, by a variance. Um, so I did this a lot of times. <laughs> I came down to the stop sign, turned left and went toward the high school, but you could never really see. Um, so you would pull part way into the road and then go the rest of the way if you couldn't see anyone coming. Um, and while I was in college, I read a newspaper article that said someone had died at this intersection doing what I had done hundreds of times. Um, they pulled part way into the intersection and got sideswiped. And that was that was that. Um, the town ended up buying out this house and garage, raising it. Um, and then it was redeveloped with a home and garage that met the setback that was farther back from the road so that you could see past there um, in order to have a clear sight line um, as to whether there was anyone coming. So this is an example of granting a variance in this case can impact the safety in a community. Um, I want you to spend just a maybe 10, 20 seconds looking at these two images. Um, what's different about the home here, um, the lot, as well as the lake that it's next to. So I'll give you just a few seconds to compare and contrast those two. All right, we could do this for quite a while. Um, and I see we've got a question coming up. We'll get to that in just a bit, I think. Um, what I wanna point out, I'm sure you've noticed some of the differences that there are trees and shrubs in place on the left-hand side, that the home is set farther back, um, and that on this side, the water looks cleaner and there are more fish. And this is based on what the science has shown about different types of waterfront development. Um, what we know is shoreland zoning was put in place in Wisconsin around 1970. Um, so we've had it in place for a long time. And it has legal requirements for homes to be set back further from the water um, and trees and shrubs to stay in place along the shoreline to hold the soil in place. So it's not washing into the lake as is shown on the right. Um, and resulting in algae blooms, as well as when soil falls to the bottom and covers fish nests, um, oftentimes those fish eggs don't hatch because they don't have enough oxygen. Um, so on the right hand side is what we have when we have variances or no shoreland zoning, variances that either allow homes much closer to the lake, allow removal of some of those trees and shrubs along the shoreline. It would take a variance to allow hard surfaces like a driveway or a boat launch to come all the way to the lake. Um, the requirement is all hard surfaces structures should be 75 feet back or farther. Um, and that's to protect the fishery and the water quality, which equates to the waterfront property value as well. Um, so in this case, um, granting variances can result in water pollution, um, can result in the spawning grounds being harmed, the fish eggs not hatching, and can result in removing trees and shrubs, um, which causes soil to erode, and then we have more algae blooms. One pound of phosphorus, like a fertilizer that's often found in soil, can cause up to 500 pounds of algae bloom. Um, so this is what happens when variances are granted that don't meet the legal standards. All right, um, another type of zoning that we have in most parts of Wisconsin is floodplain zoning. Um, some of the purposes are to protect human life, to protect health, and minimize property damages and economic losses. Um, granting variances for homes or other buildings to be built within the floodplain where they're not allowed um, can harm those purposes. Um, you've probably seen some of the flooding photos from around Wisconsin recently. Um, we are seeing more frequent and more intense heavy rainfalls. 
um, and also a noticeable uptick in the number of flooding events. Clearly, some of those have been in the news just the last couple of weeks. Okay, so now I'd like to move to our second poll. And that is, if you could tell me what types of variances are commonly requested in your community, and please choose all that apply. Um, and Becky, would you want to, I saw there's a question, would you want to read that and maybe we can respond to that while people are filling out the poll? Sure, absolutely. So Lexi wrote, I've noticed there's been an influx of people asking for variances. What, is the what are the best ways to go about explaining why a variance wouldn't be a good option for their situation? Often I explain and point to the exact ordinance that has requirements for variances, and people um, often still don't quite understand why they don't qualify for one. Sure. Okay, so Lexi, I see you're the zoning administrator. Um, so it sounds like you're taking some good steps to explain, and that's that's important. Um, without explanation, I think lots of people apply for variances. Um, with explanation, some people are still going to apply for a variance. Um, and one thing that you can do as a zoning administrator is you can't decide, obviously, whether they would get a variance or not. But you can talk about what your zoning board has done. And if your zoning board is applying the variant standards um, in a legally defensible way, um, then those variances that don't meet the standards should be denied. Um, my experience is word gets around related to that. Um, and so if your board is turning down ones that don't meet the standards, people hear that you know if you don't meet the standards, it's not gonna get granted. So that can help. Um, you're also welcome to share, you know, this webinar. There's a short um, clip uh, specifically just about variances, not so much about the zoning board itself on our webpage. And if you want to email me that, I would be happy to send that out. I think it's two or three minutes. And that's something you could watch with an applicant as well, talking about the standards. Um, sometimes hearing it from more than one person is convincing as well. So just a few thoughts. Okay, I think we can end this poll. And it looks like rear or side yard setbacks are the most common types of variances that are being requested. Also quite a few road setbacks and then a few each of shoreland setbacks or floodplain setbacks. Okay, thank you. And you might have to X out that box in order to get it out of the way. Okay, so we're going to talk about a couple types of variances that are defined in state law, um, and those are use variances and area variances. Um, use variances authorize the use of land for a purpose that is not allowed or is prohibited by the zoning ordinance. So, for instance, in the photo shown above, um, let's say this was zoned ag. Um, where this large facility is. This is a manure digester facility that brings in manure from four dairy farms and digests it. Um, and this would typically be considered an industrial use. But with a use variance, it could be allowed in a short period of time, um, just one meeting by the zoning board without any of the elected officials involved. Um, this can present problems. Um, I don't think that this is a good way to decide on large projects that could have, you know, significant effects. And it's not, it's not specific to this, you know, it could be a racetrack, it could be some factory, it could be whatever. Um, but use variances can be problematic. We have some communities in Wisconsin that simply say no use variances. Um, so that is something that can be put in a local zoning ordinance. Um, and what happens then is large projects like this, instead of being decided as a variance, as a use variance, they would be decided by a rezone, um, which would go to the governing body, like the county board or the common council or village board or town board. 
So I think that's a better way to deal with large projects, not by use variance, saying no use variances and send them through a rezone. The second type of variance and what we're gonna talk about tonight, um, most of the time are area variances. So these are dimensional variances like we just talked about on the last slide. It could be roadway setbacks, it could be water setbacks, it could be side yard setbacks. Um, these are the sorts of things that are decided as area variances. Um, and we have a court case that says area variances provide an increment of relief, normally small, from a physical dimensional restriction. Okay, for all variances, whether it's general zoning or shoreland zoning, whether it's a use variance or an area variance, um, the applicant has the burden of proof. They need to show that all three tests from Wisconsin state statutes are met. So the three tests are unnecessary hardship that's due to conditions unique to that property and it, there will be no harm to the public interest. So we'll go through each of those tests and explain them. Um, and like I said, they apply to variances from all types of zoning. I think it's important to list the three tests as well as any additional tests that may be in your own local ordinance um, on the variance application with space for the applicant to fill out what their reasons are that they feel they meet each of these tests. Um, and then similarly on the variance decision form that the zoning board members are gonna be filling out. Why does each zoning board member feel that each test is met or each test is not met? Um, and we're gonna go through all of that. Okay, so we said a variance granted may not harm public interests. So public interests are the purposes of the zoning ordinance. So if you go to the beginning of a zoning ordinance, it will list the purposes and maybe intents as well. Um, and those are what was adopted by the elected officials representing the community. So those are the purposes and a variance shouldn't be granted that will harm those purposes or public interests um, like safety by building close to the road. Um, I remember from our last poll that many of you said they, that you were seeing side yard setback or rear yard setback um, variance applications. I think there it can be harder to know why do we have a side yard setback or why do we have a rear yard setback? Um, some communities simply want larger lots, more space, you know, homes not too close together. But I think it's good to have clarification in your local ordinance as to why you have those side yard setbacks and rear yard setbacks. And if your ordinance doesn't say anything now, it's fair to ask your elected officials to clarify that, to state in the ordinance why you have those setbacks. Um, so a couple of examples, um, and I'm sorry, I'm switching to the next test, and that is conditions unique to the property. Um, I serve on a zoning board, and this property shown here on top, a home with a garage, um, this is the developable or buildable area um, shown in the dark mesh. Um, so there is significant buildable area and they put their shed outside of the buildable area and then they applied for a variance. Um, the owner said the property was unique due to a steep slope, some trees in the backyard and having a shoreline bordering on a pond. So then the role of the zoning board is to determine, are these conditions unique? Do other properties in the area have the same conditions? And is there no place, no compliant place to put the building? Um, if they could put it in a compliant location, like anywhere in here, then um, building a shed is a personal inconvenience to put it here, but it doesn't rise to the level of unnecessary hardship. It doesn't qualify for a variance. And that was the situation here. They said it was a steep slope at 4%. The zoning staff pulled up some information about you know, what's buildable um, and 4% was deemed 
buildable. So this is not too steep to build on here. Um, so in this case, we determined that they had not met the standards. This was not unique to this lot. Other lots had similar slopes. Other lots had trees. Other lots bordered the pond. Um, so there wasn't anything unique. I also want to point out that sometimes what um, applicants will say is unique has nothing to do with the property. And the standard is conditions that are unique to the property, not to the property owner. Um, in this situation, there was an applicant who wanted a larger boathouse, a larger structure, because they had a larger boat. And that has nothing to do with the property. That's a choice the property owner made. Um, and circumstances of an applicant, whether it's the size of their family or wanting a larger garage or a boathouse for the, the items that they have bought, um, that's not a factor in deciding variances. Okay, and then the third test is unnecessary hardship. Um, for area variances, unnecessary hardship is present when compliance with the ordinance would do one of two things. It would unreasonably prevent the owner from using the property for a permitted purpose, something that's listed as a permitted use, or it would be unnecessarily burdensome in view of ordinance purposes. So for instance, in this situation here, um, if this is zoned residential and they already have a home on it, it doesn't meet the first part of this, unreasonably prevent the owner from using the property for a permitted purpose. They're already using it for residential. So then the question becomes when you're trying to decide, do they have unnecessary hardship? Um, it's the second part of this. Would it be unnecessarily burdensome looking at the ordinance purposes? Okay, so what does that mean? Well, we have some court cases that shed light on it. Um, in this case, the question that went before the court was, does this family room shown here in red, um, does that, does living without it result in an unnecessary hardship. So um, the yellow dotted line is the setbacks. So this would be the buildable area in here. And the property owner built this porch or family room. It was an enclosed porch that was used as a family room um, without getting permits. And so it was an after the fact variance. We treat after the fact variances just like a variance that someone applies for before they built it. Just because they already built it doesn't mean the variance should be granted. You apply the same three tests. Um, so this is the question. Shouldn't after the fact variance be granted for the family room because removing it would be an unnecessary hardship? This came from Waukesha County. It was appealed all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, that variance should not be granted for two reasons. One, the hardship was self-created. Um, they built it without permits. And two, the porch is no more than a personal convenience. So it's a personal convenience. Living without it does not create an unnecessary hardship. The court went on to say growth of a family and personal inconvenience don't constitute unnecessary hardship to justify a variance. It's not the uniqueness of the plight of the owner but the uniqueness of the land, which is the criterion. So you're always looking for, is there something unique about this land? You know, is it the only steep property in the area? Is it the only one, um, you know, that has some unique feature of the land itself? Um, some other variance case law that's come from court decisions over the years, um, Self-created hardship, an applicant may not claim hardship if it's due to conditions created by his or her actions. Um, loss of profit or financial difficulty, those don't constitute hardship. If somebody says, well, I could make a lot more money or this property would be worth more if this or that was built on it, that doesn't constitute hardship or a reason um, to grant a variance. And then I also want to point out this last one. A variance runs with the property to all future property owners. So once you've granted a variance, 
that's a long-term thing. It is just for that building, the building that was built with the variance, but that building can stay on the land for all future property owners. So it's not like it's going to go away if it's sold to a new property owner. Okay, I want to go through some of the arguments that came before the court on this. The owner says that not having a family room, their enclosed porch, will be an unnecessary hardship because the porch is substantially completed and would have to be removed. The court responded, self-created hardships don't count. They're not, they don't count as hardships. Uh, the property owner said the lot is substandard in size. It's smaller than the minimum lot size. The court said this lot is treated the same as other substandard lots. And that's a key point in zoning is, is there equal treatment between this lot and the lot next to it? Um, the property owner said the porch could not be attached to other sides of the home. The court said the porch may not be feasible at all on the property. The property owner said they needed the porch to enjoy lake living for his family, including six children. The court said hardship is based on the property, the land itself, not the applicant. And the uh, owner said the porch would add value to the house. And the court said loss of profit is not hardship. Okay, so just to summarize, a variance can only be granted if the applicant has shown that their property meets all three statutory tests. Um, and just a word of caution, um, deciding on variances shouldn't become horse trading. It's does the applicant have evidence to show that they meet these standards, not will they do something else to try to trade to get a certain project moving forward. Okay. Um, I just wanted to note that for floodplain variances, there are additional standards that need to be met that go beyond those three. There's quite a number of them. I'm not the expert in that, but I can certainly point you toward the person who specializes in floodplain zoning if you have questions on a floodplain variance. Okay, so making these decisions, how do we go about this? Um, First, you want to ensure that as a zoning board, you're looking at a complete application, that you have all the information you need. So you want to look at your ordinance and your application forms to see what's legally required for a variance application. And if you don't have a complete application, um, you should table it. Um, you should have the property owner come back at a subsequent meeting with a complete application because there's no point in wasting your time or wasting their time if you don't have complete plans as to what's being proposed. Um, those complete plans should include um, accurate lot lines as well as setback measurements so that you know the distances between things and the size of the lot. Um, it's also a good idea for staff to apply that buildable area, look at the setbacks and see what the buildable area is. Okay, so here's an area decision, area variance decision form. Um, hopefully you have some zoning staff that can analyze the application compared to the ordinance and your variance standards um, and present their report um, containing the facts relevant to each variance test. Um, if you don't routinely see a staff report or if you would just like to see another example, there is one posted on the webpage that Karen provided. Um, down at the bottom of the list of documents and forms, there's one that says additional forms or additional resources. Um, click on that and there is a staff report. Actually, I think it's on the original list. It's also on the second page. Um, a staff report may also contain whether staff find each legal test is met or not met, but at a minimum, it should compare the facts to each variance test. Um, then it's up to the zoning board members to analyze, you know, are the tests met? So here we've got unnecessary hardship. 
the literal enforcement of the ordinance will or will not result in unnecessary hardship because, and then you fill in your reasons and you circle either will or will not, um, the hardship must be due to conditions unique to the property, such as steep slopes or wetlands. So you would look at the facts and then determine the hardship is or is not due to unique conditions of the property because, and then you would fill in your reasons here. And then similarly for the public interest test. Um, near the end of your variance decision form, um, there should be a conclusion piece and that is, are all three tests met? Um, this is what needs to be found in order to, for each of the tests, all three tests have to be met. Ordinance standards will result in unnecessary hardship. The hardship is due to unique property limitations and the variance will not harm the public interest. If all three of those are true, it does meet all three, then the variance would be granted. If there's one or more of these tests that are not met, then the variance needs to be denied. If they've met all three tests, um, then you can also decide on conditions that might apply. Um, it could be fences, it could be buffers, anything that's necessary so that this project will not harm the public interest, the purposes of the ordinance. Okay, so related to evidence, the burden of proof is on the applicant seeking the variance because they're seeking to do something that most people can't do. The ordinance says is prohibited. Um, so the applicant has to provide evidence that they've met all of the legal tests. That should be documented evidence. It could be photos, it could be a study, it could be data. Um, and zoning board members have discretion in terms of how much weight they give to the different pieces of evidence. Um, zoning board decisions have to be based on facts, not opinions or speculation, um, and consider the source of those facts. Does this person have a background in a relevant field? Do they have a certification? Something like that. Um, when a zoning board decision is appealed to the courts, these are the standards that um, the courts, the judges will apply. Do you have the authority to make the decision? Did you follow the proper procedures? Did you apply the proper standards, the variance standards, including any from your own ordinance? Were you unbiased? And are the facts in the record to support your decision? Is there evidence there? Okay, so now we're gonna go to a quick exercise here. Um, and the question is, would you grant this variance? Um, we're going to go through the three variant standards, um, and the question is, has the applicant provided facts showing that they meet all of the variant standards? Okay, so here's the situation. Um, this is a rural property along County Highway A and Horizon Lane over to the left. Um, there's an existing home and garage with a well and a septic. Um, and without any permits, um, the landowner built a garage and a concrete pad going up to that garage. Um, along County Highway A, the setback is 100 feet from the right-of-way, and this garage is only 76 feet from the right-of-way. Um, on Horizon Lane, off here to the left, the setback in the ordinance is 50 feet, and the garage is only 34 feet from the right-of-way. Um, the area east of the house has the well and septic, and the area west of the house has some underground utilities. So that's kind of the situation. So it's an after-the-fact variance. Um, and so let's go through these questions. Okay, the first is, is the unnecessary hardship test met? And if you could type in the chat box, yes or no, and then your reasons that you feel that the unnecessary hardship test is met in this case. So I'll give you a little time to decide yes or no, um, and then please type that in the chat box and whether you feel and what your reasons are for your yes or no.
Lynn, as this, um, as folks are answering this question, there was a comment um, put in the chat box about um, deck allowances compared to, um, uh, and how that would compare with elevated structures compared to, to trees. And then there was also a question posted about how conditional use permits are different from variances added with conditions. Um, so I responded to that. That is simply um, a conditional use, as you explained when you talked about permitted and prohibited uses, is that it's listed specifically in the ordinance along with condition, sorry, along with standards to consider. Um, so it would be like a checklist that's provided in the ordinance. Um, those could either be general standards that apply to all conditional uses, or you could have standards that apply to specific uses. So basically you're saying upfront legislatively in the ordinance is yes, we generally think this use is appropriate, but we wanna make sure it's tailored and appropriate for this given location. Yes, yes, I agree. So we know that our variances are things that are prohibited by the ordinance, whereas a conditional use is allowed if the standards are met, which is basically what Becky just said. <laughs> so we're all on the same page there. Um, a community, I'm reading a bit about the deck, um, has a rather small deck allowance in a floodplain to be in conformance with DNR rules. Yet the entire world raises structures in floodplains on posts. Um, I can see why if you've been to other states, you would feel that way, that the entire world raises structures in floodplains. Um, that's not so true in Wisconsin. Um, I would point you toward um, our floodplain zoning specialist. Um, she's had significant experience with floods and the floodplain ordinances. Um, I see that's Robert. So Robert, if you want to email me, I'll provide my email at the end um, and I can get you the contact for that person. Okay, so back to is the unnecessary hardship test met? I'm seeing a number of responses, quite a few no's. Um, remember, you need to provide your reasons too. Um, and I see some reasons here. Um, personal hardship is not a land hardship. I agree with that. It's unclear what the hardship would be for this person. They may very well have things they want in a second garage, um, but that's a, a characteristic of the property owner, not the property itself. Um, one person says the size of the garage and the pad could be built smaller and shifted over and back. So when we have a compliant location to build something, we don't have a hardship, also true. Um, makes additional property enforcement difficult. Um, no other alternatives to build the garage, yes. Um, no hardship is personal, not based on the property. Yes. Um, no, there's already a garage. Not sure what the hardship would be. Okay, great. Okay, let's move on to the second test. Is the unique property limitations test met? And I didn't talk specifically um, about the land so much when we were looking at that image but there are no steep slopes. There are no wetlands in the area um, where the house and the garage are. Um, so I would leave it to you again to answer in the chat about whether you feel that there are unique, whether the unique property limitations test is met in this case. Give you a little time to do that. Given the time that we've got here, about five more minutes, um, go ahead and type your thing in. Um, it says no evident unique property limitation, no showing by the applicant, the burden rests with the applicant, yes. Expanding a main structure is rarely limited, yes. Um, in this particular case, not only do they already have a garage, 
Um, but when I looked this parcel up, I found it's a little over five acres. Um, and I don't see any wetlands or steep slopes, uh, which could be unique property limitations if they prevented building in compliance with the ordinance. There may be any number of reasons that the property owner prefers to have the garage where they put it, but the ordinance was adopted with roadway setbacks to protect safety and allow, you know, expansion and utility work. Um, so I would agree with what I'm seeing in the chat box here. Um, I don't see any limitations. Um, so it doesn't appear to have any unique property limitations. And then the third one is the no harm to the public interest test met. So for this test, it's good to look back at the ordinance and intent. And I'll just read the first sentence. The purpose is to promote and protect public health, morals, safety, and general welfare of the county. And it goes on. But do you think that allowing the garage, granting a variance for a garage within the roadway setback, would that harm the public interest? And really the way it's asked is, is the no harm to public interest test met? Um, I think this one, feel free to um, put your answers in the chat and I'll take a look at those. Um, but again, we talked about it's, it's safety is the main concern when you're building in a roadway setback. Um, visual obstructions, thing, buildings closer to the road um, can cause safety problems. Okay. Um, keep in mind that if your variance is to a shoreland or floodplain ordinance, the purposes are going to be quite different. The public interests would be focused more on those topics. Okay, so then the question is, are all three variance tests met? And I feel like we had pretty good um, agreement on most of these tests that they were not met. Therefore, all three are not met. And so in this case, it would be denying the variance. Okay, so a quick review. Um, zoning board members act like judges. They have to be neutral and base their decisions on the evidence and the current laws. The zoning board members must be unbiased. Um, if you do feel that you're biased as a zoning board member, you know the applicant well, or you're just against certain types of projects, you should recuse yourself. That means don't vote and don't participate in the discussion. The zoning board is only allowed to grant a variance if the applicant provides evidence that they meet all three tests. To create a legally defensible decision, um, zoning board members must explain the reasons why each variance standard is met or not met. Um, zoning board decisions can be appealed to the courts, and if the zoning board follows the types of laws, state laws, local zoning ordinance, um, their decisions will typically be upheld by the courts. Um, we have one more poll here. Um, we'll get this launched, and you can respond to whether you plan to take any actions after attending the webinar. Um, it could be focused more on legal tests when deciding on variances, could be review and update variance application materials or variance decision forms, or share the webinar with um, people in your community, the webinar and the resources. Um, and I'll just comment that on the resource page, there are also a number of variance application and variance decision forms as examples. So if you're interested in doing that, there are quite a few options there. There's also that example staff report. Um, so that's good. Um, and I think we're going to wrap this one up. Um, it looks like we've got <laughs> pretty similar numbers um, for all of these things. So I'm, I'm excited that you guys want to do some things um, in terms of going forward from here. That's great. And you can X out of this. Um, 
And if you would take a minute, um, feel free to contact me with any questions or concerns that you have. Um, can you, I see a question, can you get the link to the resource page you're mentioning? And I believe that came in the same email that you got um, today with the Zoom link. Karen, can you confirm that? Okay, and then while we're waiting on that, um, if you would take a minute and fill out our demographic information, we would appreciate that. Um, Becky, were there other questions that I missed while we were going through? I will keep scrolling through, but I think most of them were answers to the scenario. Okay, and I'll put this back to my name, email, phone number, Feel free to reach out. And if you don't find the link to the resource page, oh, I think Karen just posted it. Yes. So right here, this the blue underline right near the bottom um, is the link to the resource page. Thank you, Karen. Um, so people can access that. Um, and thank you very much for joining us tonight.